Okay, now we move into our last unit before Christmas break. Our topic is revolution and what happens after revolution. We're going to look mainly at the French Revolution, but we'll also consider some revolutions that have taken place in the Arab world in the last five years, the so-called Arab Spring. But what does this word revolution mean anyway? When you hear the word revolution, what comes into your mind? Actually, we throw the word around pretty freely. Revolutionary new tide will get my clothes cleaner, right? There's some music revolution or another announced pretty much every year. The word threatens to become meaningless. But sometimes non-political uses of the word revolution actually make some sense. So, for example, was there an Apple revolution? Well, the personal computer pretty dramatically changed the way we work, the way we communicate, the kind of information we can get hold of easily, the kind of information we can share easily. That was a genuine and significant change in the way people lived. Let me also note that the personal computer helped cause political revolution. I'd argue that along with Pope John Paul II, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs deserve a lot of the credit for toppling communism. And why do I say that? Any guesses? Well, before the personal computer, people who wanted to write and publish something critical of the government had to get a printing press that would risk getting into big trouble. Or they had to spend a lot of money on Xerox machines. It was hard for government opponents to get their story out, especially when the government controlled the media. But once you had desktop publishing, and then an internet that could connect all those desktops, and then phones that could send photos and videos out to the whole world, well, it got a whole lot easier to get your point across. So maybe the computer revolution spawned a revolution in, well, revolutions. Just think of how those French revolutionaries could have used iPhones and Twitter and for that matter, how cell phone technology is already changing the face of revolution in the Middle East. But when we use the term revolution in history class, we usually mean an event that ushers in some really fundamental changes in the principles of rule or in the way that we live. Military historians, for instance, talk about the gunpowder revolution. We talked about that in class. Once gunpowder could blow up castle walls and pierce the armor of knights, Feudalism was pretty much over. We've just learned about the scientific revolution, about paradigm shifts, about turning the sources of truth on their head, uh, and this produced a wave of experimentation and invention that changed ordinary lives dramatically. When we talk about political revolution, like the French Revolution, we're usually referring to a change that goes way beyond toppling one ruler and replacing him or her with another. A revolution does not just change who's on top. It changes the justification for rule, why that person or group is or should be on top. So when the Roundheads cut off Charles I's head and put Parliament in charge, that was a revolution because it overthrew not only a king but a theory about kings, that they had a divine right to rule. The fact that the English changed their mind doesn't change the fact that it was, in fact, a revolution. So when Barack Obama replaced George W. Bush as president, was that a revolution? Well, it was a big deal for sure. But both President Bush and President Obama were freely elected, and their claim to rule was based on the same thing, the democratic choice of the people. So it was a major political change, but I'd argue it wasn't a revolution. Let me just add a little history note here. Thomas Jefferson wrote about the Revolution of 1800. Any guess what happened in America in the year 1800? Well, in 1800, John Adams, a sitting president, was defeated for re-election by Thomas Jefferson, who represented a different political party and held very different political views. And then something really amazing in world history happened next. What was that? John Adams got on his horse and he rode back to his farm in Massachusetts. Jefferson moved into the White House. Nobody got out their guns. Power changed from one political group to another peacefully. And yes, in world history, that was a huge, hugely important move. We've just gotten used to the pretty revolutionary, excuse me, idea of peaceful democratic change by election. I just hope we never start taking it for granted. 
So let's bring this whole question of revolution closer to home. What would a revolution look like at Juan Diego? Would it be a revolution if the diocese decided to fire most of its teachers? Well, it would be a big change for sure, but it really wouldn't be a change in the underlying principles of governance. All teachers at a Catholic school are hired by the diocese, and the diocese has the right to fire us. We signed on knowing those were the terms, and frankly, pretty confident that the diocese would behave fairly. What if students took over the school? fired most of the teachers, abolished school uniforms, and reinstated high school recess. Would that be a revolution? Yeah, I think it would be a revolution. It would not only change the people in leadership, but it would also change the basis for leadership, uh, student power. Would it be a revolution if Judge Memorial invaded and took over the school? No, I don't think conquest is quite the same as revolution, but conquest can be a spark that lights the revolution. Stay tuned for Napoleon. So I'm going to stop there and let Ms. Jacobs get on with the French Revolution. But let's keep the question open, okay? Why was the French Revolution a revolution? <laughs>